Okay, hi period seven students. Um, we are going to go over our next lesson uh, that I'm going to include in the chapter eight content, even though it's not uh, a lesson that's in your guys's textbook. So I'm gonna pull it from uh, a different source. So um, those of you who are familiar with physics, we're gonna take a look at motion, um, which is gonna deal with velocity and other rates of change. So we're gonna take a look at the relationship between the position function, the velocity function, uh, and acceleration functions. Um, and then we're gonna be making some um, calculations utilizing uh, those functions, like finding speed, uh, finding um, when a particle is speeding up, when it's slowing down, uh, total distance traveled, uh, things of that nature. Okay, so um, the first function we are going to look at is the position function. So there are three functions that we typically use to represent position in calculus. I would say the most commonly used function is the function s of t. But if we have like a particle that moves back and forth along a horizontal line, okay, uh, like so, um, we can use the function x of t uh, to model that because um, the, the position is going to be dictated uh, by movement in the horizontal direction. We use x to represent uh, horizontal change. We can also have a particle that moves like up and down on a vertical line. So if we have a particle that moves up and down on a vertical line, um, we can use the function y of t uh, to model position for um, that type of function. Okay, now, um, we are going to define velocity as the rate of change of position. And if you think back to like what we covered in chapter four when we were first introduced to rates of change, um, there were two types of rates of change that we looked at. Um, the first being average rate of change. Okay, so we can compute uh, the average velocity on the closed interval from A to B. Um, by taking, so this is v sub av, so uh, velocities, the average velocity. Um, we can calculate that by taking s of b, so the position at our ending point, minus the position at our starting point, s of a, all over b minus a. So again, average rate of change measures the slope of the secant line that contains the endpoints of your interval. And like if you look at um, the expression that we set up for average velocity, like um, the units make sense as this is going to compute a velocity of some kind because the numerator um, is going to be a change in position. So we're gonna have some kind of linear measurement for change in position. Let's say for example, um, we use feet in our numerator, and then our denominator, b minus a, is going to correspond to a change in time. <clears throat> so let's say time is measured in terms of seconds. So our resulting unit of measure for average velocity is, in this particular case, feet per second. Okay, and that's <clears throat> a representative of a unit uh, representing velocity because um, feet per second is a distance divided by a time. <clears throat> now, we can also calculate instantaneous velocity uh, at some particular time t is equal to a. So instantaneous velocity corresponds to the instantaneous rate of change. And what we've used to calculate instantaneous rate of change in calculus is the derivative. Okay, so... Um, if velocity is the rate of change of position, that means that velocity v of t is going to be equal to s prime of t. Okay, so velocity is the instantaneous rate of change of position or the derivative of position. And then if we want to calculate velocity at time t is equal to a, um, we're going to evaluate both of these at uh, t is equal to a. So v of a is going to be equal to <clears throat> s prime of a. Now, the unit of measure for this would also be a distance divided by a time. And we know that because, like, if I take s prime of t, another way for me to represent s prime of t 
is ds over dt. So that's one of the notations for a first derivative that we can use. And we should remember back in uh, the lesson on related rates, when we write our derivative in this format here, ds over dt, um, the unit of measure is dictated by the shape of our derivative. So you're going to have some distance. Uh, let's say we use like meters this time to represent distance um, divided by the unit of measure of time. So if we use seconds for that, <coughs> ds dt or s prime of t is also going to be measured in a distance divided by time, in this case, meters per second. Okay, um, there's one more calculation that we're going to uh, make, and then we'll talk about acceleration next. So we define speed as the absolute value of velocity. Okay, so if we want to calculate speed, um, that's going to be equal to the absolute value of uh, velocity. So when we try to determine the speed of a moving object, speed is always going to be some positive quantity or zero. <clears throat> okay, uh, and then lastly, acceleration uh, is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Okay, so if acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, that means that a of t is going to be equal to v prime of t. And if we relate acceleration to position, we know velocity is the derivative of um, position. So that's going to make a of t equal to s double prime of t. So unit of measure, like we know that v prime, we can represent v prime as dv dt. So your unit of measure, let's say it's um, velocity is measured in terms of um, feet per second. So your unit of measure would be uh, dv. So the unit of measure of velocity is feet per second divided by time, which is seconds. So our unit of measure for acceleration would be feet per second squared. Okay, and if you've taken any type of physics at all, um, that is how we uh, represent um, acceleration uh, quite frequently. Okay, so let's do um, a couple of examples here um, illustrating uh, some computations that we're going to make in regards to motion. Now this first example I think is really easy, really straightforward. Um, it's kind of getting us acclimated to um, uh, terminology um, and, and some calculations that we're going to be performing in regards to motion. I think the second example we're going to do is more along the lines of what you'll see in your homework, uh, what you'll see on uh, quizzes and tests, uh, but we can do this with different types of functions. So I'm going to model this with uh, polynomial functions, um, but we can do this stuff with rational functions, we can do it with radical functions, we can do it with um, exponential and log functions as well. Okay, but the mechanics of working these through are going to be the same. Okay, so directions here say to let s of t be equal to t squared minus 8t, uh, and position here is going to be measured in terms of meters. For t is greater than or equal to zero, we're going to let that function s of t represent the position of a particle moving along the x-axis. Okay, so we have several calculations that we're going to make here. Part A asks us to find the displacement of the particle on the closed interval from 2 to 4. Okay, so when we are asked to calculate displacement, what displacement refers to is a change in position. Okay, so we want to see how much the position has changed. Uh, in the two second window between time t is equal to two and time t is equal to four. Okay, so if we want to calculate this here, um, the change in position is going to be our position at our ending time. So that's s of four minus the position at our beginning time, which is s of two. Um, so we can plug both of these values into our position function. So s of four, I'll do the calculation on the side. That's going to be 4 squared, which is 16, 
minus uh, 8 times 4, which is 32. So that winds up becoming negative 16. And then we're going to subtract s of 2. Okay, so s of 2, 2 squared is 4, minus 8 times 2, which is 16. 4 minus 16 is negative 12. Okay, so negative 16 minus negative 12 is going to wind up becoming negative 4. Uh, and then our unit of measure here, because we're talking about position, that's going to be a distance. Um, so that's going to be negative 4 meters. So if you're given units in your problem, um, you want to make sure that your final answer has units written as well. So like, how would we describe the change in position? Well, between time t is equal to 2 and time t is equal to 4, um, our particle is four units to the left or four units backwards or four units down. But because our particle is moving along the x-axis, it's going to be to the left or backwards uh, from where it started at time t is equal to 2. Okay, part B asks us to find the average velocity on the same time interval. Okay, so average velocity is going to be the average rate of change of position. So V sub AV uh, is going to be uh, our position at time t is equal to 4 minus our position at time t is equal to 2 all over 4 minus 2. So we already calculated in part A S of 4 minus S of 2. Um, that's going to be uh, negative 4. And then 4 minus 2 is going to be 2. So that winds up simplifying to negative 2. And then if we think about like how this expression here is set up, um, that's going to dictate our unit of measure. So S of 4 minus S of 2, the numerator is going to be a displacement or a distance, which is measured in terms of meters. Uh, and our denominator uh, is a change in time, which is measured in terms of seconds. So that is our resulting uh, average velocity on that time interval. Okay, part C asks us to find the velocity of the particle at time t is equal to 2. So because we're asked to find velocity at a particular time, um, this is instantaneous rate of change. So v of 2 um, is going to be, like we were going to want to calculate the derivative of our function. So first v of t uh, is going to be the derivative of our position function. So our position function is t squared minus 8t. So the derivative of that is 2t minus 8. And then we want to evaluate that derivative at 2. So v of 2 is going to be 4 minus 8, um, which is negative 4. And then again, our unit of measure uh, for velocity in this particular case is meters per second. <clears throat> okay, part D. Directions here ask us to find the speed of the particle uh, at time t is equal to 2. So we know that speed is going to be the absolute value of velocity at that time. So it's going to be the absolute value of v of 2. Well, we know v of 2 is negative 4, so the absolute value of negative 4 is 4. And then again, our resulting unit of measure is meters per second. Okay, so for part E, question asks, when is the particle moving left? When is it moving right? And when is it stopped? Okay. So um, the direction of motion is dictated by our velocity function. Okay, so if velocity is positive, it's going to be moving to the right. If velocity is negative, our particle is moving to the left. And if velocity is zero, our particle is stopped. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our velocity function v of t, which is 2t minus 8. Uh, and we want to calculate where v of t is equal to zero. Okay, so that's going to happen when uh, t is equal to 4. So we're going to make ourselves a sign chart for velocity. I'm going to put that value on our sign chart. And also, uh, and I'm going to do this in a different color. Um, we, our position function here is only defined when our t values are greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my number line here, and I'm going to do this in a different color. Uh, I'm going to put zero on the number line, and I'm going to circle it because it's not a zero of our velocity function. But I'm going to put that on the number line so I don't test any values to the left of zero. Okay, 
So if I pick a number between zero and four, let's say I pick one, when I plug that into my velocity function, velocity is negative on that interval. And if we pick a value bigger than four, uh, velocity is going to be positive, okay? So uh, if we wanna calculate, and we're gonna write this in interval notation, okay? When our particle is moving to the left, our particle is moving to the left when velocity is less than zero. Now, zero is not a zero for the velocity function. And if we plug zero into the velocity function, we find that velocity is negative at that point. So our particle is moving to the left at time t is equal to zero. And it stays moving to the left until we get to four. Okay, our particle is moving to the right uh, when um, velocity is greater than zero. So that happens on the open interval from four to infinity. And then our particle is stopped when velocity is equal to zero, and that happens at time t is equal to four. So if we want to write a single number in interval notation, we just use set braces for that number. <clears throat> okay, so that gives us like an idea of like how our particle moves. So it starts out moving to the left for the first four seconds. It stops at time t is equal to four, just for a split second, and then it moves to the right uh, on the interval from four to infinity. Okay, so last part of this asks, what is the acceleration of the particle at time t is equal to four? Okay, well, if we wanna calculate A of t, A of t is just gonna be the derivative of the velocity function. So our velocity function is two t minus eight. The derivative of that is two. And then if we want to calculate acceleration at time t is equal to four, well, there's nowhere for me to plug four into that function. So the acceleration at any time is going to be equal to two. Uh, and then our unit of measure here is going to be meters per second squared. Okay, so our particle always has uh, an acceleration of two. Okay, so one more thing to talk about, and then we'll wrap up this first video, uh, and then I'll start a second video for the next example. Okay, so the question asks, when does a particle speed up? and when does it slow down? All right, so I want you to take a moment to think about that. Uh, if you're a physics student, um, this should be like a good review for you. Uh, and if you've never been exposed to physics before, um, it's gonna give you something to think about. <clears throat> okay, so the analogy that I use or uh, the way I use to describe speeding up or, or slowing down uh, is being in a car. So some of you guys may, you know, have a license or may have a permit. All of you have at least driven in a car before uh, as a passenger. Um, so you should be able to, to relate to what I talk about. So there are two circumstances where we speed up in a car, okay? Uh, and the first circumstance is when we are going forward, okay? So if we are going forward, um, we know that velocity is going to be greater than zero. Uh, and we speed up in a car going forward when we step on the gas. Okay, so if we step on the gas pedal, the velocity readings are getting bigger and bigger. Okay, which means that velocity is increasing. So if velocity is increasing, we know the derivative of velocity, which is acceleration, uh, is greater than zero. Okay, so we can speed up when both velocity and acceleration are greater than zero. Uh, and the other circumstance in the car where we can be speeding up is when we are going backwards. Okay, so if we're going in reverse, we know that velocity is less than zero. And when we step on the gas going backwards, the velocity readings become more and more negative. Okay, so if the velocity readings are becoming more and more negative, that means that our velocity is decreasing. And if velocity is decreasing, that means the derivative of velocity, which is acceleration, is less than zero. Well, what do these two circumstances have in common? Well, 
both velocity and acceleration share the same sign. Either both are going to be positive or both are going to be negative. Okay, so a particle speeds up when velocity and acceleration share the same sign. Okay, when does a particle slow down? Okay, so a particle slows down. Again, pick, let's picture this being in a car. Okay, so we could be going forward in a car, okay, where velocity V of t is greater than zero. And we slow down in a car when we press the brake pedal. Okay, so when we press the brake pedal, if velocity is positive, when you press the brake pedal, the velocity readings get closer and closer to zero. Okay, which means that your velocity is decreasing. And by definition, if something is decreasing, that means its derivative is less than zero. Okay, so the derivative of velocity, which is acceleration, is less than zero. Okay, we can also be going backward in a car. So if we're going backward in a car, velocity V of t is less than zero. And if we press the brake pedal, our velocity readings are going to get closer and closer to zero which means our velocity readings are increasing. So by definition, a function is increasing when its derivative is greater than zero. Okay, so the derivative of velocity is acceleration. That is going to be greater than zero. Well, what do these two circumstances have in common? They have in common the fact that both velocity and acceleration have opposite signs, okay? Which tells us that a particle slows down when velocity and acceleration have opposite signs. Okay, so that's something that we're gonna go over in the next example that we look at. Um, when is a particle speeding up? When is a particle slowing down? Um, we're gonna make some, um, or do some analysis with problems of that type um, in the next example. Okay, so we'll pick up uh, the next example in the next video.